Um, they've given me the green light to run through my 100 slides, so I'm going to keep doing that and teaching you everything you need to know to open up a cannabis retail dispensary in the state of Minnesota. But I'm also going to talk about cultivation, manufacturing, analytical testing, and a few very important best practices that I think would be very important for folks entering the industry uh, in the state. So just before we get started, I'll just start with a quick introduction to Can Delta. We're exhibiting just down here in aisle five, we have a nice big setup. We uh, have come a long way to be here and we're very, very excited about the market here in Minnesota. We're very, very stoked. We're extremely bullish on this market because in a year's time, this market is going to explode. It is a very, very excellent market the way it's been set up. We're very excited about it. We're going to explore why we think it's so great in the next few slides. So Can Delta is a regulatory and scientific cannabis consulting company. We are small business consultants that work in the cannabis sector. We work with folks on licensing applications, but also to operationalize businesses, help people to be successful, sustainable, and to go through the turmoil that is a cannabis licensing process. Cannabis is the most difficult, expensive, and frustrating thing you will ever do next to marriage. Marriage can definitely be a lot more expensive, especially if you don't do it right. So here we're going to talk about doing it right. Um, having said that, Minnesota's framework, again, is great for us as consultants because it is extremely complicated, detailed, and there's a lot of red tape. So we're here to help navigate that today. So with our presentation, everything you need to know to open up while well, starting and operating a cannabis dispensary in the state of Minnesota. And this is specific to you folks, okay? So who we are, we're America's number one cannabis licensing firm. We specialize in providing coaching and expertise and help with every decision that entrepreneurs need to make in this industry. That, that's what we do. We're not just people that fill out forms or submit applications. That's great. We do that too. But we're really there to get on calls with our clients weekly, walk them through the process and explore the possibilities and understand if they're making a decision, that those decisions are informed. We understand the pros, the cons, the consequences that go along with everything we're going to do here, right? A lot of the times we're really just tapping the brakes because we have a lot of dreamers in the cannabis industry, which is great. I love, I love dreamers and it's great to want things, but we also have to think the long game here and be sustainable and really think about what the next three, five, 10, 15 years is going to look like in this business. So again, our mission is to walk people through the regulatory framework, help shorten the time that it takes to get operational and lower the cost that it takes to open up your business, right? We want to shorten the time from license application to your first dollar. And we're along for that entire process. Got a great team, scientists, uh, MBAs, security experts, folks who have been through the industry a long time, retail experts, business strategists, interns, regulatory experts, got a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of talents on our team. We've been doing this for seven years. We're very, very lucky to be in this industry. I feel very, very fortunate. I went to school for a very long time and uh, the destiny for me was either going into pharmaceutical or petroleum products and cannabis is much more interesting. The after parties are a lot better, let me tell you. All right, very quickly. Who is this handsome devil in front of me? This is probably what you're asking right now. Well, let me tell you. Oops. Uh, so my name is Lucas McCann. I'm the co-founder of the company. Uh, I went to school for a very, very long time. I did 13 years of hard time in university. Came out with a PhD in organic chemistry, which if you think about it, is actually wildly applicable to chemistry in terms of manufacturing, processing, extraction, CPG, GMP, analytical testing. All these things are touched in chemistry. So it was, it was a great, great out for me instead of going into big pharma. I used to work for the federal government to control substances. So I have an idea of some of the things I'm talking about, but don't take my word for it. Uh, and I've been helping small businesses, largely folks who are probably sitting in this room, the mom and pops who are bootstrapping this without investors, maybe even taking out home equity loans to get through this process of starting their business in the cannabis industry. And if I haven't scared you off yet, well, then I guess you're probably in the right place here. Um, why is now the best time? Well, there's a few good things that are, I think, coming down the pipe that could have a potentially very positive impact. I mean, don't go waiting for these things to happen overnight. This is going to take some time to get there, but we will get there. Legalization, state level, 
municipal level, even federal level, international level, it's a huge shift to steer. It's a process, it's not an event. With the um, Department of Health and Human Services looking at rescheduling down to uh, away from substances that are extremely dangerous, and I'm sure everyone's heard about this news, and what this means when we look at the potential for decoupling from 280E, right? Has everyone here heard about 280E tax law? I've seen a lot of nods. Has anyone here not heard about 280E? It's okay if you haven't, that's not a problem. Uh, there's great accounting firms here that will be very happy to explain it to you until they're blue in the face and you're you know, very fast asleep. Um, but basically saying that if you work in Schedule 1 controlled substances, that you cannot claim business expenses uh, as part of your federal taxes, which is huge. I mean, payroll, uh, rent, um, everything sort of has to be wrapped up in a cost of goods sold. So, but with this potential for rescheduling, that would help to bring down the amount of taxes that cannabis businesses are paying has the potential for huge positive impact in the industry. Why else? What was the other reason I said this is a great time? Oh, yeah, this way. There we go. Ah, right. The potential uh, for safer banking, allowing folks to be able to cash checks, maybe take credit card payments, right? We're not even a plant touching company, and we've had our account shut down many times. Just having the word cannabis on your website, it's a death sentence as far as finances go. People are still here, no one's getting up to leave, all right. There he is. All right, the license is available in this lottery round. Now, everyone here who is nodding their heads about 280E, you probably have a very strong understanding about what's available in this round. But we'll, we'll, we'll coast through it very, very quickly. Uh, the micro-business license. Okay, small scale operations, limited plant counts, promotes local and small business involvement. And in my opinion, I think this is a very, very big contender for, uh, for where folks should be applying and spending their time and energy. We'll talk about that a little later on down the road. Very low in terms of licensing fees and allows for effectively one facility, one, one site, one operation. The mezzo business, as the name suggests, medium sized, right, allows for three cannabis retail locations. Then we've got the cultivator, the manufacturer, and the retailer, which would then allow for five businesses at that particular license level. But the micro business is one that I'm very, very, very keen on, especially if you are a startup. And not to say that you have to stay a micro business forever. You don't, and you won't have to. But to get into the game where every dollar counts, a $500 application fee is going to be much more palatable than something like ten or $30,000 if we're comparing that to something like a cultivator. Very flexible license that allows for a combination of activities. And I see that there's a lot of very smart people here have ticked every box. That's great. That's what we want to do in the industry. We want to tick every single box explore every revenue stream and make sure that we're exploring our options because we don't know what the industry is going to look like in a year, two years, three years. In addition to that, we've got wholesaler, transporter, and again, these should not be confused with delivery, right, which is B2B versus B2C. Testing facility, again, the testing of the products to ensure that they passed uh, yeast mold bacterial counts, heavy metals, pesticides, and we've got potency and cannabinoid levels being tested. And then uh, the event organizer, which is uh, the party license. Okay, I've got a list of fees here. I'm not gonna go through them, but I am gonna highlight that I'm very pleased with the cannabis microbusiness application fee and the renewal fees being very cost effective for small businesses. And I do think it's one that should be uh, drawn, we should draw a lot of attention to it because of how cost effective it is. Um, and if you didn't apply for that, that's great. That's not a problem, you know? Um, not everyone will have to necessarily stick with the tier of license that they apply for down the road. But there are effectively three ways to apply for the retail dispensary license through the micro business, the meso business license, and the retailer. List of business activities are listed here. And for all those folks who have applied, I'm sure they've ticked every one of these little boxes that comes up with the checklist there, making sure that they've opened up the possibility to all the, um, all the particular license types that are available to them. There are 10 license types available, as well as medical licenses available on top of that. And in terms of where we're at, I mean, is anyone, okay, so for, for folks who have applied here, I did see a number of hands going up. Has anyone not yet applied and are considering going through the process when that process opens up again? One, two, three, four, we got five. I'd say about five or six. Great. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the initial application, but what I really want to talk about is everything that exists from, uh, from, the time that you win the lottery until the time that you open your doors. That I think is really the crux of what this is gonna look like when setting up a small business. 
This is going to be where the money gets spent. And this is a very, very, very expensive process. Don't get me wrong. So initial key requirements, again, for setting up your business and ent entity and individual disclosures, uh, setting up an operating plan, a business plan, diversity plan, social equity verification, um, pass fail for applications. And then once those sort of pass the pass fail muster, they go into a lottery, right? And they get drawn, right? We were all familiar with this process. So again, the reason that I think that's important is the licensing application process for the state of Minnesota is actually the toughest application process in the country to get into a lottery to maybe be drunk. And I say this as an entity or a representative of an entity that works across the country and internationally. What you folks are going through as applicants is the most head heavy application lottery we've seen in the country which again is great for companies like us. That's why we're here, because we provide guidance to those folks to get through that process. If you want to go at it alone, and again, cannabis applications should be accessible to everyone. People shouldn't have to use lawyers or consultants. Unfortunately, if you don't submit all the particulars for the application process, you don't have the time to do it, or the understanding, maybe you're not part of the industry, but you're still very interested in participating, it can be, it can be challenging, it can be difficult, there can be pitfalls. You can misinterpret what it is is being asked of you. And as someone who's a former public servant, I saw this all the time, where there is this misalignment between what the government's asking for and what people are trying to give as information. And if boxes aren't ticked and the right sentences aren't regurgitated, applications will not pass muster and go into the lottery round. As simple as that. Recent states that have legalized with lottery systems include places like New York. Uh, New Jersey's got a rolling window now. So rolling applications are happening in New Jersey. Mississippi, open application window, right? Maryland, we got a lottery. Uh, Missouri's a lottery system. Ohio's a lottery system. Delaware. And Minnesota, again, the 23rd state to legalize is the hardest of them all. Lots of components go into the application. I'm not gonna list them all out, but it, it is a long list. And then the challenge here is that everything that we say in an application, we actually have to commit to in terms of satisfying to the state to be able to open. Some changes will happen, some extensions will be required, and we might not hit that 18 months for full build out before uh, operationalizing once a licensed lottery is won. And again, just a, a side note on housekeeping. I see a lot of folks taking photos. You're more than welcome to take all the photos of all the slides. This Presentation is available. If you want to come and see me or one of my colleagues who are here, we will send over either the video, the slides, or both. You just let us know what you want. We'll send it over to you. We're going to post this on YouTube uh, because we love giving free resources and information out there for folks who are going through this process. And now with ASL interpretation, which I'm very excited about. Submitting a winning application so you can control what you can, right? But you have to do what you say. It's kind of like when you go to the kitchen, you know, when you, I don't know if anyone has a lot of siblings, right? Uh, but dinner in my house with a lot of siblings is always a fight for getting all the food, right? You got to take what you need, but you got to eat what you take. It's kind of the same thing in a lottery application process, right? We want to impress people, but if we're impressing them too much and we can't commit to the things we've said we were going to do, we can find ourselves in some trouble. So we want to make sure that we're being honest with ourselves, proud, but achievable. Okay, we want to make sure that we're meeting the minimum qualifications for the lottery. Their application is accurately represented. That it's truthful. We're not misrepresenting anything or hiding anything. We have a lot of folks who don't want to disclose things like speeding tickets or uh, other potential felonies that they might have been involved with. Okay, it's very important to do that because it will come up. Uh, application limitations are, are respected, so in terms of the number of licenses we're applying for, the, the, the combinable activities, all of that uh, needs to be very well respected and compliant. We have to submit by the deadlines. Again, you can't submit things after the hour. This isn't a philosophy professor who will take your paper on Monday after it was due at uh, 12 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Making sure that we're uh, responding to any requests for more information. 
by the appropriate deadlines is going to be super important. And the failure to do so can actually put your application not just in jeopardy, but have it canceled. So it's important to get the support you need early in the process, right? Talk to people. We've got a great resource for folks on the floor here. We have a strong network of, of vendors who are here that we see at all the shows who we, we trust and we work with. And in working with us, we're giving a lot of honest opinions about who we've worked with, the kinds of experience our clients have had, right? Because the, the work that they do is a reflection on us. In terms of the top challenges for new cannabis businesses, this came out of an MJ Biz article, but it's still true today in 2018. The highest challenge here, or the largest challenge for, for folks to overcome is going to be cost and complexity of compliance. Right? What does that mean? It means implementing things like a quality management system, uh, training people on SOPs and documenting uh, recalls, documenting inventory appropriately, making sure that we do everything that we've told the state that we're going to do or we've agreed to do by virtue of getting a license. Then below that are things like managing growth and scalability. We work with a lot of people who want to go very, very big, very quickly. But that's not always a successful strategy when starting a new business. It's okay to want things, right? It's not necessarily okay to finish sort of this grandiose idea of what a business looks like to you before you actually get open, right? We want to, we want to sort of, we need to grow at the pace that the market is growing at, okay? And failure to do so can result in things like insolvencies. We've seen people lose, lose homes because they've taken out home equity loans. We've seen families torn apart, friends become enemies. And then following that, we have uh, federal law compliance, intervention, taxation, uh, com competition, banking, and the list sort of goes on from there. But the cost of compliance, again, remains to be one of the top two things that folks struggle with as a challenge. We've done a lot of very exciting things in outdoor cultivation. Outdoor cultivation, again, has to come with a few caveats here when we're considering this, right? And when I speak to folks, I go back to the first two reasons about why it's an exciting time to get into the cannabis industry. When we talk about things like rescheduling from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, that has the potential to open up doors. That has the potential to open up doors not just from a taxation perspective, but to components like, for example, interstate commerce, international markets, international trade. So our company has worked with um, those who have cannabis facilities that are producing pharmaceutical grade cannabis and we ship that around the world. We ship it to Europe, France, Israel, Germany. We ship it to places like Australia, right? And when we're looking at things like outdoor cultivation, a few simple changes in the way that a business can set up can allow you to access these markets down the road. Look at GACP, Good Agricultural and Collection Practices. Look at GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices. If you aren't aware of this and you're on the production side, spend some time and look at what that means and what it looks like to put a facility to that level of standard. We've done greenhouses, which are often considered to be mixed lighting, right? Usually a mixture of sunlight, LED, light deprivation curtains. What are the consequences of not having light deprivation curtains? Indoor cultivation the kinds of materials that you need to use when setting up a facility. So if we look at the facility over here on the left, your left, where it reads trust core panels, this is a smaller micro-sized facility. Contrast to the one on the right, which is a 60,000 square foot West Coast, fully vertically integrated production facility with over 30 grow rooms, nurseries, tissue culture labs, all the way down to vape pen, filling, packaging, beverage manufacturing, canning, bottling, uh, and shipping to, uh, to state wholesalers. Manufacturing, we see a lot of similarities between cannabis manufacturing and CPG, consumer packaged goods industry. A lot of the same practices. Uh, both these cases, we have uh, uh, cannabis facilities here involved in the manufacturing stage, which is very, very exciting. The processing and extraction stage. These are some ethanol extractors. Uh, there's two views here actually. There's a line down the middle. The one on the left is a ethanol extraction which then goes into molecular distillation to distill out specific molecules that can then be reformulated into properly dosed vape pens. 
to uh, two carbon dioxide supercritical extraction machines uh, from a, a processing facility. That one again was out west. Uh, cannabinoid profile testing for the analytical testers, testing all of the required cannabinoids that are required to be as part of the label uh, for a cannabis product, and adult use dispensaries. A great business model is to look at those who are already, for example, involved in the industry uh, doing CBD retail, CBD products, uh, CBD, let's say, or hemp edibles. Uh, very, very similar business model, and those who are involved in that industry are usually very well poised for success when it comes to opening up a dispensary. Uh, very similar business model, a little bit more on the regulatory side, on the reporting side, and on the um, form filling compliance side. Anyone here involved in CBD retail, selling edibles right now, hemp produced edibles? No one? Okay, great. So, very quickly, what to expect in your first year in terms of costs and build-out strategies. Again, I'm going to sort of focus in a lot more on the retail dispensary aspect of what this is going to look like. And the first step, as we hear in business school all the time, is location, location, location. Choosing a location is going to be ultimately extremely important. One from a compliance side to ensure that you'll actually be able to operate in a place where you've signed a lease for and have committed to. But two, um, we want to make sure that we have adequate foot traffic, excellent visibility to all those who are passing by, who may not have been necessarily out on their days errands to purchase cannabis products, but who see your beautiful store and decide to waltz in and take a look and converse with the bud tenders. Both of these are extremely important. On the compliance side, we want to make sure that cannabis businesses are outside of a thousand foot radius. This again is as the crow flies, not as the wolf runs, right? So we're talking straight lines on a, on a Google map, right? They have to be at least 500 feet from daycare facilities, residential treatment facilities, and uh, public parks used by minors, playgrounds, athletic fields. This is very important. Zoning compliance is extremely important. And again, this is just from the state level. There's also these municipal layers that can then take into place. And I don't know if anyone's heard about what's been happening in New Jersey, but the municipality in, Jer uh, in Jersey, they're running the show. They have full control about who's operating there versus places like, let's say maybe like in New York, where it's a little bit less controlled by the municipalities because they have more general sort of opt-in, opt-out status. Incorporating uh, physical security and design principles is extremely important when we're talking about the rings of security. Deter, detect, deny, delay, defend. And this gets incorporated from the time in which we're selecting an appropriate location to operating years down the road, extremely important. This is a case study of a CBD retail store that we had converted to a cannabis retail dispensary. This store was the first one, uh, our client, uh, opened up in, uh, in New York, in the entire state, in the general application round. It was our client. They converted their CBD retail store to a cannabis retail dispensary business. They had a few cameras in there that were legacy, so we had to take a look at, for example, the security layout. And in Minnesota, again, we've got some pretty strict requirements in terms of physical security for visual surveillance. Uh, so the regulation state 720p, we need entrances and exits, exits covered with visual surveillance, intrusion detection systems, we need a uh, secure storage room with intrusion detection access control. So coming in, when we came into this project, we, we, you know, we looked at the cameras that they had existing. Unfortunately, a lot of the cameras were um, sort of a pick and mix system. You know, they had like a ring camera over here, a wise camera over here, and then some legacy systems. So we unfortunately had to restart that all uh, from scratch, put in proper systems that were all sort of tied and networked together, and include uh, a lot of redundancy in the systems as well to ensure that we're covering all particular areas. If one camera goes out over a point of sale, there's the redundancy from perhaps two other cameras that would cover that same area. That's extremely important. The retention in Minnesota that's required by the state is actually relatively high. So we need 90 day retention on your visual surveillance. And one of the biggest line items that you'll see in your build cost will be on physical security costs. Cameras are not that expensive, but the servers that maintain that visual surveillance for the 90 days can be a very, very expensive line item. When we're looking at cultivation facilities, those servers, because of all the numbers of rooms that they might have, the size of the building in general, 
the servers alone, we're talking, we're in the terabytes, right? The tens of terabytes. And those servers are about the size of a, B, like in terms of cost, is about the cost of a BMW, right? Like a six series BMW. So 50,000, 75,000 for the servers alone. So a look at store layout can actually have a significant impact on the total build cost from a physical security perspective. A box is very, very easy to secure for visual surveillance, right? Camera in each corner, maybe one in the center that's sort of a fisheye uh, pendant style camera can get total coverage of all those areas. But when we start doing L-shaped stores, rectangular stores, we put up inter interesting fixtures in the middle of the store, tall display cases, aisles, it gets complicated and it gets expensive. This is an example of a production facility in which we've taken um, our client's floor plan here. They're comfortable with us using this. And this is an example of some of the um, intrusion detection and access control systems that were required to be installed. So that little yellow card that's shown on the inside and on the outside of that room is a fob swipe. And in addition to the fob swipe, which is a card swipe, there is the pin pad. So they have two factor, dual factor identification. And this is in and out of every single grow room. Fob in, fob out. You have effectively a, a data sheet that shows everyone's day from, from movement, from the time they enter the building, all the way until they exit the facility at the end of the day. Uh, and then when the last person leaves and the fob knows how many, how many folks are in a room based on who's sort of buzzed in and buzzed out, uh, they can alarm automatically when the last person leaves. If you tailgate off of someone, that is follow somebody without fobbing yourself out, you're locked out from the rest of the facility. You have to get back into that other room that you didn't fob in on, fob out again, and then you can go through the rest of the facility. And again, why are we doing this? Because it's cannabis, right? It's not alcohol we're talking about, come on. Out of control, right? This is a uh, production manufacturing facility. This is showing a process flow here. When we look at this particular floor plan, what we were really aiming to do was to minimize uh, the amount of distance and create some sort of linearity from a GMP perspective with the process flow of the cannabis products. So cannabis products, we typically like to, to travel in a line. We start with biomass, they go into drying, trimming, curing rooms, manufacturing rooms, storage rooms, packaging rooms, and then shipping and receiving. That's sort of the ideal way to, to set this up, almost like a digestive system of product. This is easy from a sanitation perspective, but also from a logistics and operations efficiency perspective. And this is a very canical retail dispensary floor plan. This one probably represents, I would say, about 75% of the retail dispensaries that we've seen in, in some capacity. Scale is sort of uh, up or down a little bit, where you have uh, a gated entry, where you have ID checks or some kind of uh, uh, check at the front, a sales floor. We're going, we're going right to left here. And as we're in the center, we see the point of sale, which is the white line that goes about seven eighths of the distance up the map. Behind that, we have a secure storage room in which product is sto uh, stored. Products are picked from that room and then um, put through a pass through with no sort of lines of sight from the sales floor out to the sales room floor when an order is placed. And then behind that, we have our administrative areas, employee areas, restrooms, and so on. When putting together these plans, we have to use things like satellite images. We have to use um, city archives for, for, for example, floor plans to get a strong sense of what's gonna be required from a visual surveillance standpoint, and use particular design tools to try to minimize the amount of cameras that are gonna be involved in these facilities to ensure that we're, we're saving on costs. And we look at things, for example, like use, right? And process flow again on retail dispensaries. We showed that one just a moment ago with the production facility, uh, the processing facility, which products were sort of flowing around in a U shape. And this one is a little bit more, um, well, I guess it's somewhat similar for where the sales floor is located versus where the secure storage is located. Again, it's that same one we had shown just a moment ago, just facing up and down. And we look at areas where customers will be able to travel to and where they're restricted from access. You know, we're looking at a rights of least privilege philosophy when building these security plans, which means that every employee can only access the areas in which they need to access. For instance, your secretary in a production facility should not be able to go into your secure storage room, right? Their badge should not be able to gain them access to that area.
This is an example here of an intrusion detection system in which we're showing uh, visual surveillance monitors, intercom stations, uh, vibration sensors, and our central viewing stations for the, uh, for the visual surveillance. So the secured storage room is located in the middle there with all the blue boxes in it. And whoever would be picking the orders from the customers on the sales floor would have access to that central viewing station. That central viewing station is very, very important to provide security there for the entire retail operation because those folks maintain site on everyone that's in the store at all times, even if the bud tenders are deep in conversation with someone. They can see how many clients or customers are in the store at a time. They can see what they're doing, where they're going. And there's some great analytics tools as well that can help use AI to help sort of provide some amazing insight based on your point of sale data, along with what's happening on visual surveillance to alert you to things like loss prevention. So typical costs for physical security systems for a retail dispensary can range from anywhere from $10,000 to $60,000, depending on the layout, the size, uh, and the shape of the facility, as well as how use has been determined for uh, the retail dispensary as well. What are the layouts and is there sort of a consumption area involved there? How big is the secure storage? Is there no secure storage at all? We talked a little bit about redundancy, which again is very, very important. So uh, love going into retail dispensaries in every state I'm at, uh, everywhere I'm traveling to, and, and take a look to see how folks have done it. And again, we've talked about the issue of redundancy, right? Uh, having cameras over point of sale systems is extremely important, it's required. So in this case, we've got a dome style camera mounted at about 15 feet on the wall on the very far right side there, overlooking the point of sale, capturing the identity of everyone who's coming up to the till. Further to that, we've got a fish eye dome, dome pendant style camera in the center of the room, looking over top of the display cases, which can see the faces of the people who are the bud tenders behind the counter, as well as what's happening behind the display cases uh, in front of them. One exciting thing about the industry is the use cases of not necessarily cannabis intended equipment being used in other areas. Now, cannabis is not so unique that we have to buy cannabis display cases, right? But there are uh, folks out there who sell cannabis display cases and market them as such. Uh, oftentimes, you will, you will discover that when buying cannabis intended products, you'll be paying a premium. This is an example of a display case that was made for a jewelry store, which has the shadow resistant coated display cases on top with the lock drawers underneath, which is the compliant way to store cannabis product. This would prevent someone from uh, a smash and grab uh, because again, we got the special 3M coating over top of that display case, the same coating that would go over top of, for example, the store window. And a great example of what a manager's or security office could look like. Sometimes in tight spaces, and we see this a lot in Manhattan, is you gotta be very creative about the use of space. This particular manager's or security office was actually located inside the secure storage where the products were being stored. So sort of a multi-use area, which also sort of um, tripled as an employee area where they could rest, take their jacket off, hang it up on the wall, and, and, and have a bit of a break while they were sort of keeping eyes on the central viewing station here for the store. Looking at intrusion detection is very important. This is an example of a door schedule here in which we've got a simple uh, door contact sensor with a piezo alarm that taps into a junction box. And again, when we're looking at a lot of the doors being used in production facilities, we're typically talking about 16, 14 gauge steel doors, commercial grade, commercial grade handles uh, with non-removable hinge pins. This is an example of what the safe side and the attack side would look like for a barrel lock. So for intrusion detection on doors or access control on doors, we have key systems as one. We have electric strikes with ID card readers and pin pads for two-factor identification is another. That red box next to the door handle is an electric strike. So when someone comes up with the proper credentials on their fob, they swipe the door, um, the door uh, or so the fob sensor, put in the proper pin. That electric strike gives. The door contact is shunted and the employee can then open the door and walk into the room. The reason something like two-factor is important because if someone walks up to a door with a card that they found in the parking lot, they can't necessarily get entrance all the way to the secure storage. So we love two-factor identification, at least on the secure storage. And then again, for something like an exterior door, 
Very similar on the attack side, we just have a doorbell alarm where you can identify the person who is ringing the doorbell, have a conversation with them before you open the door. When looking at the secure storage room, we make recommendations to get as close as possible to an FBI evidence room. So these are rooms that the FBI would use to store evidence for, for cases, right? So we're looking at uh, integrated metal mesh. If we're not doing metal mesh, we can bring sort of that level of build down to, for example, integrating sheets of plywood in between the drywall and the studs. Where we're putting things like electrical outlets and vents, making sure that they're far enough away from doors so that they can not be used as access points, moving them up off the floor so it makes it more difficult for folks to sort of bang them through and get in. And then what visual surveillance would also look like in these areas too. So long, big, secure storage areas will often require aisles, which will then require more cameras in those areas too. This is an example of a pass-through used at a retail dispensary. This pass-through looks very much like a bookcase on its back. And the idea here is it minimizes any sight lines from the inside of the secure storage area in a retail dispensary to the sales floor. When orders are rung up based on each cubby hole, each cubby hole represents a point of sale system, a little bag would get dropped in with that product being dropped in with the receipt stapled to it. This minimizes sight lines. Anyone coming into the store can't see how much product's being stored in the back and also um, hides how many people are actually in the back watching the central viewing stations or the little monitors watching all the cameras. And then simple racking system with plastic display cases to keep the project, uh, product fresh. Now, as a retail dispensary, there's some considerations we want to look at. Uh, one is environmental control. So aside from the security stuff, you know, that's important, that's great, but we also want to make sure we're looking at uh, temperature and humidity control in these rooms. We do not want the product to spoil on our timeline, right? We don't want to be the plug on the block with the dry weed. We've got to make sure that we're keeping humidity above 70%. We're keeping that temperature in an ideal range between 60 and 80 degrees. Cannabis is happy when it's, you know, at a certain, certain threshold of temperature, right? Outside of that, no matter how hermetically sealed a cannabis product will be, it will leak humidity in, in a dry room and it can, it can lose effectiveness and, uh, it has limited stability, right? So we want to make sure everything is staying fresh. And also when looking at inventory orders, we want to make sure that we're only buying what we're able to sell, right? Money gets locked up in inventory. We want to use things like FIFO, first in, first out, and making sure that all the products that we're getting into our inventory are eventually getting out the door, which is super important because money is tied up into inventory. SOPs are a very important component, not just for the application, but also for the operations of the store. Stores will be audited, oftentimes as part of the renewal process for that license. And with SOPs come forms. And those forms are very important to show that all the things that you promised the state that you're going to do, such as training new staff, uh, recording new inventory as it comes in and comes out, actually gets properly documented. Even down to cleaning the restrooms is something that in some cases in a production facility, a production facility actually needs to be very well documented with times, signatures, names, uh, and note sections as well. Those SOPs often need to be reviewed. When writing SOPs, we cannot make them too onerous. We wanna make sure that we're writing SOPs to the right level of what we're actually going to accomplish and what's necessary. And I give the example of sanitation SOPs. So if we say we're gonna clean our grow room facilities top and down every single day because we want that license, and that's a completely unrealistic expectations if we got plants that are flowering in particular rooms, we're not going to do that. And if we're not going to do that, it's going to show on the visual surveillance and it's going to be reflected in the forms that we need to fill out as well. So we want to make sure that we're achieving what, what we set out to do and that we're filling forms properly. Okay, in terms of costs, so what does it cost to sort of set this up? What can I expect in terms of build out costs? In terms of numbers, I would say be ready to spend as a retail dispensary a quarter million dollars. Can you do it for cheaper? Yes. Can you do it for more? Absolutely. Quarter million is kind of your safe spot, right? If you have access to up to the $250,000, you should be able to launch your facility, operationalize it, hire some staff, you know, once you're operating, and last about a six month burn, right? The burn is what we try to minimize in the consulting area for our clients. That is the time from when you acquire a lease for your, the, time, the time you're responsible for those lease payments until the time that you can actually generate revenue and, and start building towards your, your return on your investment. Okay, and in terms of the build-out costs, 
I would say anywhere from 90 to $250 per square foot is what you can expect to spend. On average, let's say 75 to $100 for a minimum built, right? We're talking concrete floors, just like what we're standing on now, unfinished, drywall, simple rack lighting. Basic build-out costs, again, those will cover things like drywall, painting, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing. Uh, flooring, if we want to do something a little bit fancier, we're looking at 10 to $30 per square foot. Again, this is sort of above that level of, of concrete finishing. Lighting uh, can be expensive as well because it's required in every single square inch of the store. That can range from anywhere from $5 to $20 per square foot. Uh, fixtures, so custom cabinetry, shelves, countertops, 10 to $40 per, this is actually supposed to be, I think, per linear foot when it comes to cabinets and display cases. Uh, signage and branding elements, typical cost can range anywhere from $5 to $15 per square foot of your facility. And then security system costs, 10 to 25 is kind of the average, but it, it can go up depending on the size of the store. In terms of square footage, what are some numbers that you folks would think would be sort of an appropriate range for a retail dispensary? Just like shout them out at me. How much? 75? 2,500? Okay. That's good. 1,000, yep. 3,000. Okay. If I was doing this, I would try and, me personally, do something between 1,000 and 1,500 square feet. Build it small, build it tight. Has anyone been to New York in the last little while? Anyone seen those bodegas, those smoke shops they have running? How big are those? 30 square feet, maybe? These things are holes in the wall, right? And these guys kill it. They got lineups going out the door. Lineups. That's a great thing to have. We want lineups. Like, honestly, that's, if we got lineups, we're doing something right, right? Something's going well if we have lineups. So we do see a lot of these grandiose plans where people are getting 5,000 more square feet. They want to do consumption lounges. And, that's great, and if you have the budget, I'd say let's go for it, let's do it. But if this is your first time doing it in this bootstrap, I would say 1,000 to 2,000 square feet is gonna be plenty of room. The smallest one I've ever done and licensed was 450 square feet. That was tight, but we got it done. They literally had their manager's office in their secure storage room. They hung up the cameras themselves. They installed display cases they found at us basically on, uh, on some kind of auction website. And I think their total spend was just under 50,000 bucks. So it is possible to do with less. Is it comfortable? It's a little tight, but you can do it. 250 is the number, I would say. In terms of sources of funds, this is challenging. In terms of sourcing of funds, I mean, it's basically, it's basically this here. Everyone on that slide, that's your, that's your friends and family right there. Bank loans, probably not. Grants, very competitive, very tough to get. Personal savings, home equity, friends and family, that's gonna be uh, number one. If you're looking for investors, it's a possibility. It's definitely a possibility in frameworks where we have limited numbers of licenses, but if you're going to chase to ask for your half million dollar loan, it might not happen. It's unfortunately very, very expensive, not just to build the store, it's very, very expensive even to play in this lottery. So we want to make sure we're doing that right. Okay, do's and don'ts. Very, very quickly, I'll run through a couple of these. I think these are great to consider. All right. Okay, so we want to make sure that everything we're selling is properly packaged, excise stamped. We want to make sure that uh, branded merchandise and the apparel containing licenses, brand and jewelry, sizes. Um, and things that we cannot sell in the store, this is important. Food, beverages, tobacco, water, candy that's not infused, toys and games, that's a big no-no, right? We're limited to cannabis, cannabis products, cannabis accessories like paraphernalia. That's basically it, maybe shopping bags. So number one I would say is focus on what's needed now. It's very, very healthy to want things. My mom used to say this to me every time I saw a cool toy ad on TV. Right? Holiday season would be coming around the corner, she'd say. It's healthy to want things. We're here to pump the brakes on things. You don't have to build the biggest, most grandiose thing. If you want to put in menu boards, maybe do it six months after operating and kind of see what the market looks like. You don't have to do it all on day one. Let's do a soft launch, get open, make some, make some capital back, put some money in the, back in the bank of mom and dad and uh, make sure that we are scaling appropriately, right? So grow first, scale second. 
Second mistake I see very, very often are people going out and hiring 10 staff when they got their license. Putting people on payroll. You do not want to do that. Hiring should be the last thing on your mind. It really should be. Payroll is very, very expensive. We want to do everything ourselves for as long as humanly possible. Talk to people who have done this before. Oh, sorry. Before that. Shop around for everything. So that includes services, that includes products, vendors. Uh, there are some folks who go out there and they get three quotes. They always just go for the middle one, you know, the cheap, the expensive, and they're like, oh, the middle sounds about right. That, that, that's a good philosophy too, but you know, check references, you know? There's a lot of folks out there who are, you know, cannabis consultants, who are hobby consultants, who, you know, read the regs and feel good about it. Comes with a risk. Uh, cannabis lawyers. We're working in a state where cannabis has only been really around for a short period of time. I mean, how can you really be a cannabis? I don't know. So just check references is important. Talk to people that they've worked with. See that they're comfortable. If folks are reluctant to give you names of folks that they've worked with, could be a red flag. Could be. Uh, things like presence at, uh, uh, at shows, events, opportunities that they've, they've spoken, it can usually be good in, you know, indications that you're working with folks that have done this for a while and know what they're doing. You don't want to pay someone to learn, right? I mean, that's really the biggest thing, right? Because it's kind of your time and your money. You don't want to be making the mistakes with someone who's looking to get into the industry. Number four, talk to people who've done this before. This is very, very important. Minnesota is not the first state. It's the 23rd state. There are people who have done this before, right? And 90% of what we're going through is going to be the same thing as what Colorado did, California did. Like there's going to be mistakes made. The mistakes will probably be the same. The regulatory framework, entirely different. The politicians, the timelines, the costs, all those will be different. But the general way that the markets look, what we can expect, we can expect to see a lot of similarities between what we're experiencing here today in St. Paul, Minnesota, versus what they've been seeing in Manhattan and New York. Talk to people, network, come to trade shows. You're already doing the right thing. Everyone here is already well on their way, right? There's a lot of very experienced folks out on the floor who would love to talk about their time and their experiences and the things that they've seen. It's very important in this. Tell your friends and family that you have decided to ruin your life and make sure that you lean on them for support because they're gonna be very, very important to help you get through this. Uh, when it comes to capital or even just moral support, very, very important to have a good solid network of folks that you can do this with. Again, cannabis is gonna be the hardest thing you will ever do. It might even be the most expensive thing you will ever do. It's very important to let the folks know that you're going through this process and you're gonna be very poorly available for the next little while because you're gonna be busy. You're an entrepreneur now and it's gonna be a very challenging time. All right, so in terms of some people you should talk to while you're here, uh, look at point of sale systems while you're here. This is very important. Folks who are doing security installation, monitoring, uh, IT, there's gonna be folks who are doing IT who are gonna be important to talk to. Architects and civil engineers do come into play down the road once we've won the lottery. We're going through the process of doing electrical and HVAC and designing our production facility for looking at things like GMP. Uh, floor plans are gonna be very important. Realtors, engineers. There's a lot of banks, lawyers, and insurance providers here. Unfortunately, I have to put them on the most exciting ones, so they're not at the top, but you probably would want to get a couple of cards because eventually we'll have to talk insurance. Uh, but what's great about it is I've talked to, I think, people that do all these things here at this trade show, and I at least know that there's banking, there's insurance, there's IT, there are lawyers here that will help you out and ask questions. And of course, you have us at Can Delta. We're at the booth 511 here, just outside of this little seminar room. We're going to be here all weekend. We'd love to answer your questions too. We do have some really great resources on YouTube. We're going to make this available to anyone that wants to come and talk to us. We'll send you an email with a link to this video. I'll give you the slides too if you want to take a look at that. And we've got some great stuff that's specific to Minnesota licensing up on our website. So please feel free to visit us at candelta.com. And I'm here for your questions. I really appreciate your time and attention, folks. I really uh, appreciate the time to talk to you. So thank you. Any questions while we're, uh, while we're in there? Feel free just to shut them out and walk around.